Hugh O'Neill, was an Irish Gaelic lord, Earl of Tyrone and was later created the O'Ne Acute Ill. O'Neill's career was played out against the background of the Tudor conquest of Ireland, and he is best known for leading the resistance during the Nine Years' War, the strongest threat to English authority in Ireland since the revolt of Silk and Thomas. Early life, O'Neill came from a line of the O'Neill dynasty, Darb Fine, that the English authorities recognised as the legitimate successors to the chieftainship of the O'Neills and to the title of Earl of Tyrone. He was the second son of Theodorcha O'Ne Acute Ill, known in English as Matthew O'Neill, reputed illegitimate son of Con, first Earl of Tyrone. Shane O'Neill, a legitimate son of Con, employed the ambivalent status of Matthew's paternity to affirm his own claim to the title the O'Neill. Although illegitimacy in itself made little or no difference in terms of the Irish legal system of Darb Fine, where five degrees of consanguinity through the male line with a blood ancestor who had held the O'Neill title were required of any claimant. Once Matthew was accepted by Con as his son, he was as entitled to the O'Neill lordship as Shane, although, if proven, Shane's constant assertion that Matthew was actually an adoptee, affiliated to the O'Neills, rather than the illegitimate issue of Con would have rendered his claim to the earldom void and would have entirely disqualified him from succession. Also under Darb Fine, in the ensuing conflict for the succession Matthew was killed by the O'Donnell followers of Shane and Con, placing his sons Brian and Hugh in a precarious situation. The continuing support for their claims came from the English administration in Dublin, which was anxious to use the reliance of the sons of Matthew on their support to break the independent power of the O'Neill Lords of Ulster. This was part of the general English policy to transform Irish Gaelic titles into feudal titles granted under the Crown that would bring them entirely within the English legal system through a policy known as surrender and regrant in which the Irish forcibly surrendered their lands to the Crown and had them granted back into their keeping as property of the Crown, rather than the property of the Sept, or Gaelic extended family. O'Neill succeeded his brother, Brian, as Baron of Dungannon, when the latter was assassinated by Shane's Tanaster, or deputy, Turlo Luanee O'Neill in 1562. He was brought up in the English colonial outpost known as the Pale, by the Hoveneden family. Not in England as has been erroneously claimed in various histories, but after the death of Shane he returned to Ulster in 1567 under the protection of Sir Henry Sidney, Lord Deputy of Ireland. In Tyrone, Hugh's cousin, Turlo Luanee O'Neill had succeeded Shane O'Neill as the O'Neill, or chieftain but was not recognised by the English as the legitimate Earl of Tyrone. The Crown therefore supported Hugh O'Neill as the rightful claimant and as an ally in Gaelic-controlled Ulster. During the Second Desmond Rebellion in Munster, he fought in 1580 with the English forces against Gerald Fitzgerald, 15th Earl of Desmond, and assisted Sir John Perrow against the Scots of Ulster in 1584. In the following year he was summoned to attend Parliament in Dublin as Earl of Tyrone and, in 1587 after a visit to the court in England, he was awarded a patent to the lands of his grandfather, the first Earl, Con O'Neill. His constant disputes with Turlow were fermented by the English with a view to weakening the power of the O'Neills. But with the growing power of Hugh, the two came to some agreement and Turlow abdicated in 1595. Hugh was subsequently inaugurated as the O'Neill at Ulahog in the style of the former Gaelic kings, and became the most powerful lord in Ulster. Career O'Neill's career was marked by unceasing power politics. At one time he appeared to submit to English authority and at another intrigued against the Dublin government in conjunction with lesser Irish lords. In keeping with the practice common at the time, he bribed officials both in Ireland and at Elizabeth's court in London, though entirely supported by the Dublin administration in his early years. 
He seems to have been unsure whether his position as head of the O'Neills was best secured by alliance with the English or by rebellion against the advance of their government into Ulster from 1585. In the early 1590s, English government in Ulster took the form of a provincial presidency to be headed by the colonist Henry Baginal who lived at Newry. In 1591, O'Neill roused the ire of Baginal by eloping with his sister, Mabel, but showed his loyalty to the crown with his military support for his brother-in-law in the defeat of Hugh Maguire at Balik in 1593. After Mabel's death, O'Neill gradually fell into a barely concealed opposition to the crown and sought aid from Spain and Scotland. In 1595, Sir John Norris was ordered to Ireland at the head of a considerable force for the purpose of subduing him, but O'Neill succeeded in taking the Blackwater fort before Norris could prepare his forces. O'Neill was instantly proclaimed a traitor at Dundalk. The war that followed is known as the Nine Years' War. Nine Years' War O'Neill followed Shane's policy of arming the people, rather than relying as Turlow had done upon Scots mercenary soldiers, such as Redshanks or Irish professionals employed under Buenacht. This policy allowed him to field an impressive force, with cavaliers and gunpowder supplied from Spain and Scotland, and in 1595 he gave the Crown authorities a shock by ambushing and routing a small English army at the Battle of Clontibret. He and other clan chiefs then offered the Crown of Ireland to Philip II of Spain who refused it. In spite of the traditional enmity between his people and the O'Donnells, O'Neill allied himself with Hugh Roe O'Donnell, son of Shane's former ally and enemy Hugh O'Donnell, and the two chieftains opened communications with King Philip II of Spain. In some of their letters to the king, intercepted by the Lord Deputy, Sir William Russell, they were shown to have promoted themselves as champions of the Roman Catholic Church claiming liberty of conscience as well as political liberty for the native inhabitants of Ireland. In April 1596, O'Neill received promises of help from Spain, and thereafter chose to temporise with the authorities, professing his loyalty to the crown as circumstances required. This policy was a success and, even though Sir John Norris sought to bring him to heel, O'Neill managed to defer English attempts on his territory for more than two years. In 1598, a cessation of hostilities was arranged and a formal pardon granted to O'Neill by Elizabeth. Within two months he was again in the field, and on 14 August he destroyed an English army at the Battle of the Yellow Ford on the Blackwater River, in which engagement Henry Baginal was killed. It was the greatest of all setbacks to English arms in Ireland. If the Earl had been capable of driving home in his advantage, he might have successfully upset English power in country as discontent had broken out in every part, and especially in the south, where James Fitz Thomas Fitzgerald was asserting his claim to the earldom of Desmond. In reality, O'Neill required foreign intervention and, despite his growing reputation in Europe as a commander in the field, this was not yet forthcoming. Eight months after the Battle of the Yellow Ford, a new Lord Lieutenant, the Earl of Essex, landed in Ireland with the largest expeditionary force ever sent there from England. Essex found that O'Neill had been waiting to see what might be attempted against him, acting on the Queen's explicit instructions, and after some ill-managed operations in the south of country, he had a parley with Tyrone at a ford on the Lagan on 7 September 1599 when a truce was arranged. Elizabeth was displeased by the favourable conditions allowed to O'Neill as she reasonably pointed out. If she had intended to simply abandon Ireland, she would not have needed to send Essex there and by Essex's treatment of him as an equal. The Lord Lieutenant then travelled back to the Queen's Court near London without permission, a desperate move, which culminated in a failed attempt to take the Tower of London against the Queen's authority and his execution for treason. The Queen was in a tricky situation, because political discourse was dominated by the issue of the success 
succession to the throne. Just as her most illustrious military commanders were being frustrated by O'Neill in the middle of the Anglo-Spanish War, the rebel earl continued to concert measures with the Irish leaders in Munster, and issued a manifesto to the Catholics of Ireland, summoning them to join his standard as he protested that the interests of religion were his first care. After a campaign in Munster in January 1600, during which the English plantation of Munster was destroyed, he hastened north to Donegal, where he received supplies from Spain and a token of encouragement from Pope Clement. The eighth. At this point the controversial Jesuit, James Archer, was effectively operating as his representative at the Spanish court. In May 1600 the English achieved a strategic breakthrough, when Sir Henry Dockra, at the head of a considerable army, took up a position in O'Neill's rear at Derry. Meanwhile, the new Lord Deputy, Sir Charles Blunt, 8th Baron Mountjoy, marched in support from Westmeath to Newry, compelling O'Neill to retire to Armagh. A large reward was offered for the rebels' capture, dead or alive. In October 1601, the long-awaited aid from Spain appeared in the form of an army under Don Juan de Ragula which occupied the town of Kinsale in the extreme south of the country. Mountjoy rushed to contain the Spanish, while O'Neill and O'Donnell were compelled to hazard their armies in separate marches from the north, through territories defended by Sir George Carew, in the depths of a severe winter. They gained little support en route. At Bandon they joined together, and then blockaded the English army that was laying siege to the Spanish but owing to poor communications with the besieged Spanish and a crucial failure to withstand the shock of a daring English cavalry charge, O'Neill's army was quickly dispersed. The Irish army retreated, and the Spanish commander surrendered. The defeat at the Battle of Kinsale was a disaster for O'Neill and ended his chances of winning the war. O'Donnell went to Spain to seek further assistance, where he died soon afterwards. With a shattered force, O'Neill made his way once more to the north, where he renewed his policy of ostensibly seeking pardon while warily defending his territory. English forces managed to destroy crops and livestock in Ulster in 1601-02, fatally weakening his power. In June 1602 O'Neill destroyed his capital at Dungannon and retreated into the woods of Glenconquina. Early in 1603, Elizabeth instructed Mountjoy to open negotiations with the rebellious lords and O'Neill made his submission in the following April to Mountjoy, who skillfully concealed news of the death of the Queen until the negotiations had concluded. Peace settlement O'Neill went with Mountjoy to Dublin, where he heard of the accession of King James. He presented himself at the court of the King in June, accompanied by Rory O'Donnell, who had become chief of the O'Donnells after the departure of his brother Hugh Rowe. The English courtiers were greatly incensed at the gracious reception accorded by the King to these notable rebels. Although O'Neill was confirmed in his title and core estates, he immediately fell into dispute with Chichester's Dublin administration upon his return to Ireland. Under the 1603 peace agreement most of his land had been given to his former Brehon law tenants. In the case of the ban fishery, the government eventually established that his entitlement to the benefit of that property was nullified on account of the original Anglo-Norman. Conquest in 1172, a precedent of significant implications for the former Gaelic polity. In the meantime, it was the dispute over O'Neill's rights concerning certain of his former feudatories, Donald O'Cahan being the most important, that led to his flight from Ireland. They were now freeholders of the Kingdom of Ireland with new legal rights, but O'Neill expected them to support him as in the past which they declined to do. In O'Cahan's case the O'Cathane clan had traditionally inaugurated the O'Neill kings in the past. Chichester consider O'Cahan's case to be pivotal, as if he caved into O'Neill then other Ulster chiefs might also be persuaded to give up to their freehold rights, and another war might follow. This dispute dragged on till 1607, when O'Neill was invited by King James to go to London to argue his case. 
warned, however, that his arrest was imminent. The decision was made to fly to Spain. Flight The Flight of the Earls, one of the most celebrated and lamented episodes in Irish history, occurred on 14 September 1607. When O'Neill and O'Donnell embarked at midnight at Rathmullin on Loch Swilly on a voyage bound for Spain, accompanying them were their wives, families and retainers, numbering 99 persons, driven by contrary winds to the east. They took shelter in the Seine estuary and were told by the Spanish to pass the winter in the Spanish Netherlands and not to proceed to Spain itself. In April 1608 they proceeded to Rome, where they were welcomed and hospitably entertained by Pope Paul V. The journey to Rome was recorded in great detail by Tadh Giochanain. However, his hopes of military support founded as Philip III of Spain wanted to maintain the recent 1604 peace treaty with James I of England. The Spanish economy had gone bankrupt in 1596 and its European fleet had been destroyed some months earlier by the Dutch Republic at the Battle of Gibraltar. This suggests that the flight was impulsive and unplanned. In November 1607 the flight was proclaimed as treasonous by James I. A bill of attainder was passed against O'Neill by the Parliament of Ireland in 1613. He died in Rome on 20 July 1616. Throughout his nine-year exile he was active in plotting a return to Ireland, toying variously both with schemes to oust English authority outright and with proposed offers of pardon from London. When the former Crown loyalist Sir Cahir O'Doherty launched O'Doherty's rebellion by the burning of Derry in 1608 it raised hopes of a return, but the rebellion was quickly defeated. Upon news of his death, the court poets of Ireland engaged in the contention of the bards. Status in Ireland. In 1598 O'Neill appointed James Fitz Thomas Fitzgerald, the so-called Sugar Earl, as Earl of Desmond. Two years later in his camp at Inniscarra near Cork City he then recognised the celebrated Florence McCarthy as the McCarthy Moral Prince of Desmond. The fiasco of the 1599 campaign by Essex in Ireland added to the power vacuum in most parts of Ireland. O'Neill had little influence on the Lords of the Pale in Leinster, and his army had to feed itself by plunder, making him unpopular. He made enemies of some lords by interfering in their traditional autonomy if they did not give him their entire support. These included Lord Inchiquin, Ulick Burke, 3rd Earl of Clan Ricard, the McGuinness of West County Down and Theo Boyd Narlong Burke. O'Neill issued a proclamation to the Pale Lords on 15 November 1599, many of whom were Roman Catholic protesting that his campaign was not for personal power but only for the freedom of the Catholic religion. This was unconvincing to them, as before 1593 he had practiced as an Anglican and was not known for having any great interest in religion. At the international level O'Neill and O'Donnell had offered themselves as vassals of King Philip II of Spain in late 1595, and suggested that Archduke Albert might be crowned Prince of Ireland, which was declined. In late 1599, in a strong position after Essex's failed campaign, O'Neill sent a list of 22 proposed terms for a peace agreement to Queen Elizabeth including a request on the status of future English viceroys. This amounted to accepting English sovereignty over Ireland as a reality, while hoping for tolerance and a strong Irish-led administration. The proposal was ignored. Family O'Neill was four times married to Catherine O'Neill, daughter of Brian MacFellum, chieftain of the clan AODH Beardy O'Neills, Judith O'Donnell, Mabel Baginal, and Catherine McGuinness. He had a large number both of legitimate and illegitimate children. Four legitimate daughters, including Sarah, Courtine, who married Sir Henry O.G.E. O'Neill, grandson of Shane the Proud, and Alice who married Randall Mac Sawley MacDonnell, the two latter having issue in the O'Neills of the fever, including Captain Con O'Neill. 
with whom Bonnie Prince Charlie Stewart escaped from Culloden, two illegitimate sons, Turlo and Con, four legitimate sons, Hugh, Henry, Brian, John. His many descendants include Arthur Wellesley, 1st Duke of Wellington and Queen Elizabeth II. Dramatic portrayals Hugh O'Neill was played by Alan Hale, Sr., in The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex. O'Neill is the central character in Brian Friel's play Making History, which is concerned largely with his third marriage to Mabel Baginal. Friel describes the marriage as a genuine if ill-fated love affair. In the BBC drama Elizabeth Arhe is played by Patrick O'Connell.